afternoon, everybody. It is amazing to see all these wonderful faces, and in particularly faces of many different ages. This is wonderful, and I'm just thrilled. We had the most beautiful drive down here. <clears throat> we were about two and a half to three hours away, um, just outside of Athens, Ohio, at Ohio, near Ohio University. <clears throat> so thank you, because as we left town, we had very little cloud coverage, but as we got here, the most beautiful puffy clouds started appearing. Thank you for those beautiful clouds. Morgantown, West Virginia. Um, I have other thank yous, of course. Um, we want to thank the library for having us here. And the person responsible for that is Sally Deskins, who's hiding in the back. <laughs> she herself is an artist. I don't know if all of you know that, but she's an amazing visual artist. And you will be able to see her work starting uh, October 13th in Ironton, Ohio, which is Ohio University Southern. Um, we want to thank the Women's Resource Center for co-sponsoring as well, West Virginia University's LGBTQ Plus Center and Center for Women and Gender Studies, and of course Campus Read. Uh, we just heard about yeah. <laughs> and uh, Dean Karen Diaz as well for being here today and for lifting us all up. Thank you, Dean Diaz. It was a pleasure meeting you as well and to be greeted by you the minute I came in the door. <clears throat> so, um, we do have this nice brochure, and in it are listed all of the artists who are participating this year. We have 24 here today, as long as Melissa came. I'm not sure Melissa's here yet, and she may, oh, good, I was afraid you were still looking for parking. <laughs> um, so we have 24 of our artists here today. We don't talk about our work. We simply get up, we tell you who we are, and we read, and we let you take from our work what you like. But also in this brochure are a few little prologues that kind of give you an idea about the work, give you a little clue. I think you can also see on the front all of the um, events that we're holding this year for Women Speak. <laughs> and we'd love for you to come to all of them if you could. And then I think the one that might be closest up for you would be Parkersburg, West Virginia, which is in December. So we'd love to see you there. It's always a little bit different. We shake it up. The other artists will likely join us. We have a musician that uh, participates that will be there in December. Um, this is the ninth year of the Women of Appalachia Project, featuring 32 fine art and 33 spoken artists from Pennsylvania, Georgia, Virginia, Kentucky, West Virginia, Ohio, Alabama, and one dear migrating soul who came to us all the way from New Mexico. <clears throat> this is the first time we are all coming together this year. This is the beginning of our season. So many of us do not know each other, and some of us do. But today, we're giving you our very deep and raw selves. If you feel like laughing, please laugh. And if you feel like crying, please cry. We will cry with you, more than likely. So if you're from Appalachia, you go to realize early on that many people have an image of an Appalachian woman, and they look down on her. The Woman of Appalachia Project was created to address discrimination directed at women from the Appalachian region by encouraging participation from women artists of diverse backgrounds, ages, and experiences to come together, to embrace the stereotype, look beyond the superficial factors that people use to judge her. <clears throat> we um, have a chapbook that we put out every year. We have copies here today if you care to purchase one for $10. And there's a piece from each of the artists who participated last year. And we will be creating one for all of the artists that are participating this year. So we'd like to share that with you. I'd also like to mention the Appalachian Advocate Award, which is given to a woman every year that um, is not necessarily an artist but concerns herself with issues concerning Appalachian land, families, communities, and health. And there are some of these little flyers over on the book table. And if any of you know of a deserving woman who should be nominated for this award, I really hope that you will take the time to uh, submit a packet for such women. And I'm sure there are many, many women in this area that um, would be deserving of that. 
I'd just very quickly like to thank Morgantown Magazine for including this in their uh, current uh, issue. So my artists don't even know this, but hey, we're in Morgantown Magazine. Uh, when Sally reached out to me, which uh, was wonderful and um, a great surprise, and asked if the women of Appalachia Project might like to come to Morgantown, I said, oh yes, I would love that. I had done a workshop here in 2014, loved it, didn't even mind climbing these hills, and that's why y'all are so skinny, because you got these nice hills to climb up and down. <clears throat> I probably ought to come back. Um, so she said, well, we've got this amazing um, exhibit of Appalachian photos. And I said, oh, that seems perfect. Great. And then I got on the website and realized that it was Roger Mays looking at Appalachia, looking at Appalachia um, photo series. And I, I just almost dropped to the floor because it couldn't be more perfect. I think in, in different ways, we're doing the same work. We're out there inviting people to submit their work to lift up Appalachia, <clears throat> although Roger's making a, a good bit of money at it, but that's okay. <laughs> We're glad. We're glad he is, because he's got expenses. So anyway, I personally am sending up a prayer that all of us here and beyond keep up the good work of lifting up Appalachia, and it's hard-working, honorable, salt-of-the-earth people. I give you women speak. I'm Cheryl Denise from Philippi, West Virginia. The boy from down the hill, age six, races up the snowy woods, jacket unzipped, boots untied, yelling, Cheryl, Cheryl, I got you a Christmas card, waving it high as he can after I baked his family whoopie pies for the holidays. Age seven, telling stories at the bonfire until my 90-pound mutt steals his sausage. Should I put the dog in the house, I ask? Sorry, he's a bully. No, I gave him my sandwich. I'm not hungry, he insists while petting the dog and standing as far from him as possible. I roast two more. He eats both while I hold the thief. Age nine, learns to smoke behind a round hay bale with his older brother before running across the field hollering, we gotta tell him. Bucket after bucket of water, we load the pickup, the burnt smell rising. Takes three days for that bale to smolder to nothing. Age 13, carves RS, loves MC in the bark of my husband's tree stand. Age 14, grinning, wears his football uniform home from school, walks a mile from the bus stop to his shot-up trailer, bounds up the steps, knocking over the drive shaft that props up the porch roof. Age 15, jimmies the lock on Earl's back door, steals a TV, a jar of loose change. Earl asks him to pay it off in yard work, feeds him lunch, no police, no reports. Age 16, roughs up an elderly man over some weed. His mom says she didn't raise him like that. Three months in a tough love camp. Age 17, mom in jail, a hazmat team in the yard, a dismantled meth lab, Age 18, pictured on the front page of the Barber Democrat, blank stare, shaggy hair, in the regional jail for cooking meth. Age 19, hit with a crowbar by his older brother. I hear this on the scanner at the beauty shop. Age 20, shows me pictures of his two kids on his cell phone. They live with their mothers and he still lives with his in the trailer. No heat, no electricity, black garbage bags over the roof. 
age 22, sheriff staked out by my hay barn in the early dark, then running, yelling. But two nights later, I hear that generator again. Age 24, I pick him up hitchhiking, ripped jeans, beer breathed, his face a plowed field, dirt and stone. But I see that six-year-old, his full name scrawled across the manger. <laughs> Panic attacks. You think I am an engine or leaky faucet you can fix? Say I talk vague and need precise words. I'm a poet, I should have them, those words the doctors can't pull out of me or won't. You wait, eyes soft as summer, voice soothing as soup. Like poison, I say, a whiff of curdled cream, a spoon held to my lips, I must eat one spoonful, two spoonfuls, three. Then I explode, slowly. Ashes everywhere in the kitchen, in the living room, outside the picture window, wavering above the grass. Ashes, but I'm alive and screaming. And someone is tossing them gently, as if it's a game, as if they're in charge, telling me to be quiet, go away. I like to do as I'm told. I want to pass. But I failed grade two and liked it. Easier the second time with the new kids who didn't know about that afternoon I wet my pants during math. No one laughed, politely pretended not to see, but still. The second year, I knew some answers and waved my arm. I want you to stop looking at me, stop probing. I don't tell how I pulled over on my trip to Elora last fall wrote you a letter, instructions, permission on how and when to leave me. How I kept it two months in the glove compartment, then tore it up, buried it in gas station trash. What I do say is all the colors turn off and my insides jabber and tell lies and my dark red meat twitches like I am full of candy bars and coffee, like I need to sprint around my old high school track, find the mistake. But I don't know where it is. And meanwhile, all the pieces float farther and farther, dispersing in the hay field, dispersing in the hay field, slow, and impossible as that puzzle in the back of my second grade class the teacher wanted me to finish. The pieces must fit together. I try to gather the ashes on my tongue. These are the words. Looking for divinity at the beauty shop. The trouble was stylists. They talk. Daughters running for fair queen. Strapless gowns and stilettos. What teacher did what for no good reason? Whose husbands cheat and why? I don't know how to enter this talk. How to stop it? Years ago, when smoking was still in vogue, a stylist lit a cigarette, curled the white smoke above my head. She had scissors. I said nothing, nothing, while she, tethered to a coiled phone cord, orchestrated rides, child care, dinner duties. Why can't beauty be quiet, like meditation or prayer? Incense burning for us, the divine, in our gray plastic capes. I want the poet Diane Gilliam to color my hair, to be her only friend for this hour. She could talk Bible stories, folk tales, myths, the old knowing, women intuitive and brave as her hands scrub my scalp. I don't like to think myself vain, I asked my sister, and she said I can dye my hair another eight years. 
took almost two to find medium ash blonde. I've dreamt of going platinum, eyebrow wax, manicures. My stylist asks if I need a little glitter in the hair gel. As if this is ordinary, me, 50, and dreaming of being a Breck girl on the back cover of Seventeen. <laughs> to let you all know you don't have to clap after every single piece but if you could wait and clap as the, the person finishes I think that might be nice you're going to be worn out we got 24 people <laughs> we want you to be happy good afternoon um, I'm Kathy Coltis Lentis um, I grew up in the flatlands of West Central Ohio, but for the last 30 years, I've called the hills of Southeast Ohio home. Everyone I meet, everyone I meet is someone I already know. Her photograph sat atop my grandmother's mantle, next to that hideous clock that told every half hour. And she was there in 73 when the Burkett clan gathered at the home place to celebrate Pop's 100th. Oh, the rain, buckets and bathtubs, and then a perfect double rainbow. I remember that woman's face, her shoulder length brown hair, glasses with pink tips, tiny diamonds at the corner playing the light. His prickly white beard, and the way he leans in to grab what his hearing aids can't quite catch. We were on that train, gliding from Boston to Portland in June. The spangled ocean gleamed between scarce buildings and scrub pine. And at one stop, a Ferris wheel rose out of nowhere to surprise us. Some of us got on a bus in Chicago, headed to the Art Institute. Van Gogh, Monet, brilliant day, until it wasn't. I sat near the indoor fountain, eating bits of croissant, when blood, hot, thick, nearly black, poured from inside me. Everything slowed. Two women held me up, draped a coat over my shaking shoulders, and guided me through the strange city, back to my borrowed bed. Even if our paths crossed today for the first time, thank you after all these years. You, he, she, they, we, everyone I meet is someone I already know. <clears throat> no matter. To sleep easy and safe like the dog at my side. To know there is someone, perhaps a god, no matter, who will fill my bowl, my bed, my hours with what I need. Understand that when I pause at the door wanting to leave, looking back, needing to wander, but knowing you, he, she, a god, no matter, will follow like a safe shadow, belonging yet separate. And the door will open to warmth and light when I need warmth and light. And there will always be a small space between us, never too little or too much. And that life will go on like there is a god who cares, no matter. I'm Susanna Nestor. I forgot to wear my banner that said I'm the New Mexico person here. But 
that would be me. I uh, grew up in Appalachia and live uh, mostly off the grid in the mountains of northern New Mexico. So similar lifestyle. <laughs> My first piece is called Christmas Rain. Television brought the world to our living room. A zenith, black and white, 1950s excellence, displaying white Christmas and winter wonderland on a 24-inch screen. Our whole family gathered in front of it, ogling, cheerful. Who ever heard of a white Christmas until there was a television to reveal there was such a thing? It is what everyone outside this holler sees on Christmas Day, I thought. Somewhere, treetops glisten and children listen. Bright diamond white snow falls just at the right time. The stroke of midnight on Christmas Eve, or maybe even the day before. Kids get sleds and ice skates and squeal with glee. No one is ever cold and their colorful knitted scarves and matching mittens while they ring bells and sing outside by a crackling fire on TV. We have rain, mud, soggy galoshes, burners at the Detroit steel mill that stink up the air, turning raindrops black, even on Christmas. We have a steam radiator to sit by, not a fire. Only poor folks have fires. Count your blessings, Mother said. It's such a beautiful day and hush your foolishness, Mother said. I didn't see much beauty, but went out in the rain anyway. Cindy Pinson got white, shiny white ice skates that year and a red velvet skirt with matching sweater and tights that looked like real skin. The beige color was perfect to make it look like she was bare-legged, just like on TV. She looks so pretty skating around her double wide on the carpet. A white fur muff to keep her hands warm and a matching fur hat. I would die to have all that. Never mind that ice skating on green shag carpet was not what they did on TV. We were sure we had it right though, down to the Christmas music. We skated all day in that living room and it didn't matter too much about me not having any skates. After all, our gloppy ponds had water moccasins in them. You didn't want to fall through, even if the ice had a shine. Trees formed a dark canopy and there was no light. People just don't go in there. Year by year, I woke up eager on Christmas morning, longing just once for the day to be merry and bright. It had to be real somewhere. But the dawn welcomed a leafless skeleton of trees dripping sooty water. Mud slid down the hills, threatening our back door. Copperheads stood out in all the gray, their shiny yellow eyes staring if you get too close. It's the same everywhere. Just hush your nonsense, Mother said. And I crawled into the pain of my own silence. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, the next one is called Road Trip. Oh, that echoes. <laughs> okay. Dad bought a new Rambler. Maybe it wasn't actually new, but we thought it was new. And we were leaving Ohio for West Virginia to visit all the relations. Ham salad sandwiches were packed. We had an ice chest with plenty of pop and even some Barks Red cream soda. I eagerly donned a black corduroy cowgirl outfit, flared kneeling skirt that twirled, and matching vest with red embroidery like Dale Evans. Halfway there, we stopped at a restaurant. I didn't quite know what to expect. This was a fancy place where you sit down to eat. The restaurant had curved windows and sat up on a hill. The specials were painted all over the windows butt steak with tossed salad and rolls and butter. That sounded good. I was excited beyond words. Inside, there were families dressed nice. Seeing it was how it was only Thursday, dads looked like they just got out of church. Moms were dressed up wearing high heels and beauty parlor hair. 
No one looked like us. I was mortified. Nine years old, and I prayed for invisibility or even death, which might be more practical. My mother had a head full of brush curlers tight against her scalp, thin drip of coffee stain on her blouse. Earlier that morning, she had rolled my hair up too, slapping my face with the brush not to act trashy and to curl my hair proper. We gotta look nice when we get there. Your dad's family is farm people and we have to show them we're respectable. <coughs> they don't even have air condition in the hills. Besides, you don't know any of these people, so what do you care? I didn't think it was too respectable to be in a restaurant looking the way we did, figuring out the right fork for your salad Replacing the napkin proper on your lap was pointless with wearing itchy antennas on your head. I told my mom I'd rather be trashy and not have curlers in my hair today. She got red-faced and made my nose bleed all over my new cowgirl outfit. I choked back the tears. Maybe restaurants just weren't for me. Glad that was over. I found invisible in the back seat pretending to sleep through long hours of driving on curves through the mountains. If I couldn't be trashy, at least I could be dead for a while. We finally arrived at the family farm near St. George, West Virginia. There was a big white farmhouse with screened porch, big garden, and a creek outside. There was a summer kitchen out back to cook in so the fire didn't heat up the house. A cold root cellar for the vegetables it felt like Eden there. Aunt Lessie helped me change out of my bloody clothes and fix my hair. A somber look on her face. Then hugs and smiles and pure joy. She had supper waiting. Fried chicken, mashed potatoes and gravy, homemade white bread, blackberry cobbler, warm milk straight from the udder. Cousins were home from college over in Roanoke where Uncle Alice teaches. One is studying a fiddle, and he calls it a violin. He showed it to me. Everything was so pretty on real china plates, and all the dishes matched. We didn't even eat in the kitchen. I'm Jessica Corey. The bulletin actually has me listed as Ohio. I grew up in southeastern Ohio and currently live in the mountains of North Carolina. How did I miss that? I apologize. I migrated <laughs> to a different part of Appalachia. Okay, so this is called part of the problem. The news reports deported thousands of dollars. Money-wise, they're as flat as a tire on a Dodge Neon left outside a rehab clinic in Ohio. Much like heroin, this trend of manufacturing data is one of the biggest contributors to the machine that suggests home is addicted and outsourced. The TV told me a story. Friends robbed from parents and men from spouses. Women short on support because the institution had to pull out of the deal. To fill their time, the tiny rooms in my mind are blowing up. Calls, the rise of women, live, a force of labor working two-thirds harder to end the ravage patterns the predictions used to joke about. And I'm done. Yeah. Can I do anything? <laughs>